Hello, what's happening everyone? Welcome to the fortnightly q and I haven't done one of these for a while, but I'm going to try and do one every fortnight and see how we go for a few weeks, a few months. Um, hopefully another way to engage with my followers and community. So um, if you're online now and seeing the broadcast, it'd be great if you could just put a plus or a Y in the chat. Um, if you're using Facebook, you have to kind of, you can do an anonymous. Um, but otherwise, you can, there's a little thing, ticker <laughs> on the bottom of the screen there about how to connect to chat properly on the Facebook as well. But I can see we've got a couple of people joined us already, so um, great to see you here. Um, yeah, let us know who's um, joined on the stream. We've got uh, welcome to new guys. Get the Where you're from here? I'll have to just check get that out. Uh, hi, Sherbaz, how are you going? Anyone oh, just joined us? Uh, feel free to say hello in the chat, whether you're on YouTube, Facebook, I believe we're both to LinkedIn as well. Um, we're doing three different platforms and actually two groups a group on Facebook and a, and a Facebook page as well. So great to have you. So while we're waiting for people to join, um, it's a nice sunny day here in Newcastle. I've just had my First coffee for the day, so I'm a bit more charged. Um, I've got my new pack of Sharpies, uh, which I've been using to make some notes on a few topical um, issues that I wanted to maybe go through a little bit of mini training with you guys today. Um, a few things to sort of cover in terms of where we're up to in the medical careers process here in Australia. But this is, of course, an opportunity for you guys to engage with me and ask you know, any random questions you might have about the medical careers, recruitment, application, interview, coaching, etc. process in Australia. Um, uh, and we can have a little bit of a chat about that. So I've got a couple of topics I want to get through and then um, we'll sort of get to your Q&As. Uh, so I see that Shabazz wants some help with the AMC. So we can definitely cover off on that, Shabazz. We'll, we'll get to that today. So just like Shabazz has done, um, say hello in the chat uh, or put any question or query you've got uh, in the chat. But the first thing I wanted to cover off today was the topic of cover letters, because this comes up fairly regularly for me. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's something that um, kind of has come up a few times with a couple of my clients that I work with through coaching clients. So the question is, um, do, you know, do, do I need to write a cover letter and how do I write a cover letter? Um, so let's let's talk about that a little bit, and I've got some some uh, notes here. So my first note is to say, newspaper pre-internet. So I actually got my hands on one of these this morning. Uh, that's my local free newspaper. Uh, it's full of ads, but not job ads. Um, and that's my point. Um, in the good old days, we had things like these, um, uh, and this before you know, kind of internet online. Um, application portals and what have you, um, we, you know, the way to find out about job openings was through the newspaper. So in Australia, there's a paper called The Australian, and it does a weekend version called The Weekend Australian. It's owned by Rupert Murdoch. Um, hi there, Abdul, and hi there, Josie Marie. Um, and so that paper, you know, on the weekend, half of that paper literally was full of job ads. They must have made a lot of money um, out of... Um, out of job ads in that newspaper. So in the in the old days, there was an ad that outlined the job and the selection criteria and how to apply, etc. Um, and we didn't have, we you know, we were starting to get things like email, etc. But essentially, in the old days, you would actually write physically a letter and attach your CV or resume and send it in as your means of applying. Now, nowadays, obviously, we've got the internet. Uh, and online portals that make things a lot more efficient and speedy and easier, and we use email communication. So when we often write letters these days, we're just sending it by email via the common means. We hardly ever send the, the physical form these days. And in fact, when they send you a contract out, usually for a job these days, they don't send you the paper form, they just send you a digital form. So the first question is, do you need a cover letter, yes or no? Um, and look, I'm on a bit of a mission to say, let's try and get rid of this redundant document, um, I don't think it's actually necessary these days. Now, there's a school of thoughts that says, well, maybe we should try and get them to write a letter to see if they can write a letter because that's something that's not as well taught or learnt um, in medicine these days. And I would 
kind of agree on that. But I think getting someone a, a cover letter is a lot different than writing a letter about a patient um, from a specialist perspective or to a specialist if you're referring them. Um, so I don't really support that sort of notion as a reason for having a cover letter. But there are essentially now two, two situations in Australia when you're going for medical jobs um, in terms of whether you should or shouldn't write a cover letter. The first situation is where you have to. So with a lot of the online job portals in Australia that you come across, um, and I have got them linked on the Advanced Med website. I might just sort of actually, it's a good point for me to sort of bring this up for you guys. I'll just uh, switch to me in the corner here. Um, so on my main blog site, there's a really handy section here. Uh, useful for, well, this is mainly put together for international medical graduates, but local trainees can use this bit of it as well because what I've done here is I've put a link about a third of the way down to all the various job recruitment portals that I recommend that you look for for jobs and sign up to for alerts. So they're all the state ones, um, plus SEEK. I think SEEK's probably the best kind of um, non-specific job aggregator site for medical jobs in Australia. So you often see a few more jobs, particularly ones advertised in general practice or the private sector there that you may not see on these. So anyway, when you go to these portals, they will vary. Um, some of them are quite sophisticated. And for example, the New South Wales portal specifically asks you not to uh, upload a cover letter because they won't read it. Uh, hello, um, Mary, Mary Fris, uh, nice to have you on board as well. Um, so in that situation, they say not to do it. But in others, um, I think one like WA Health, for example, theirs is a fairly more basic recruitment portal and they basically ask you to upload a couple of documents against the job, one of which obviously is your resume, but then um, there's usually one where they ask for a statement against the selection criteria. So this is a difference with a lot of the online portals. So rather than writing the cover letter about how you address the selection criteria in the cover letter, you're going into the portal and usually there's like text box sections that you they might have a character limit for and you've got to write your justification in there. So that basically makes it redundant in that particular situation. So some in some cases they want you to do that because it's basically their system hasn't got um, text boxes or what have you to collect the selection criteria statements. So if you do have to do that, do that. But what you're really doing is writing a couple of pages. Usually there's a limit based on your justification for those criteria. So pull out each criteria, make, make a heading for each and then put your justification underneath. And that's, that is your selection criteria statement. Uh, you can then sort of add a page on top, which might be your actual formal cover letter. Um, but then you've got the attachment, which is the selection criteria. But the second situation, which is becoming more and more common these days, is they either don't specify or they say you don't have to. So if they say don't do one, obviously don't do it. Um, but if you don't have to, what I recommend you ought to be doing is not writing a cover letter per se. What you're really writing is a cover email. Because even if you're going to write a cover letter, you're going to attach it to an email which has a cover letter on it. So you can put like you can pretty much write a letter in a, an email if you do it properly. Um, and the funny thing is, you know, you, with your cover letter, you're attaching your CV. So you might attach something which then says you've attached something else. Cut out the middle document, if you like, the cover letter, and make yourself a brief cover email. Um, I really do make it brief. Um, uh, I've got a little um, resource here that my VIP clients and some of my other clients have access to. But you can actually make your cover email very brief. So here's a way of doing it. You've got to address it, obviously, to the recipient's email address. You want to make it clear that you're applying, uh, that you, who you are, you're applying for the job. Put the full job title as per the job ad. And then make sure you add this bit that says resume attached. They'll probably see in their email that there is an attachment, but it's always good to do that. Then you want to put the full title of the person you're applying to, dear Dr. So-and-so. Um, this is a first sentence. I'm writing express enthusiasm for the position of full job title. Um, I offer insert your biggest strength that meets one of the key selection criteria. You know, that might be just the years of experience you've got in that area or the procedural skills you've developed specific to that role, something like that. Um, the big, this is your teaser bit. Uh, and I believe I'm a strong candidate for the role. They always want to know that you're confident and feel that you're a strong candidate. Uh, so that's the second sentence. Third sentence, to this email I've attached my resume which outlines how I can meet and exceed the position requirements. Fourth sentence, 
Fifth sentence, I look forward to discussing my application for this position or any other super position. So that's five sentences in an email. That's all you need to do because you're attaching to this document a well-optimized resume, hopefully. Um, and I've got videos on my channel about how to do that. And I've got services to help you if you need more assistance with that. But this is a marketing tactic and email, if you like. Basically, you're letting them know that you're applying, that you feel you're strong, there's, you bring one key bit of value, and if they want to know more about you, they need to come read your resume. Um, because you don't want them to sort of spend all this time on a cover email or cover letter when they can actually go and look at the, the document that you really want them to do. And of course, your resume is geared um, to hopefully getting you into the interview. So there's three steps. There's yeah, three steps here. We're getting them to read your email so that they read your resume so that they want to interview. We want to make that as simple as linear and linear as and quick as possible. Um, so that's for the actual job. I do also have a template if you're just sort of doing cold emails, slightly different. Um, but you're again writing express interest in the type of roles. Um, uh, if there are specific reasons, like your registration reasons, you should make that clear. Um, uh, something that you found about the hospital, because this is a cold email, your biggest strength, attaching your resume. Uh, again, you're not just interested in a specific role, but anything else suitable as well. So that's my take on the cover letter situation these days. As I said, there's a couple of situations. Um, one, situation one, where you have to, unfortunately. Situation two, where you don't have to, where maybe you could get away without having to do one at all. But if you do decide you want to, um, probably better off to do it in an email format, um, in, the, in the format that I've outline there for you today. So um, let me know if you've got any questions about the cover letter process. Um, I do often have um, clients who really struggle with um, selection criteria and what to write and all that sort of stuff. Um, that can be a bit of a challenge. It's not something that comes easy to everyone. Um, uh, but there's some tips and tr uh, tactics around that as well that I'm happy to share. And of course, um, that's something that I do offer as a service on my web start as well. Um, cool. Um, so that was the first thing I wanted to get through today. The second thing is um, we are coming up to the medical internship um, uh, well, it's a period of <laughs> recruitment, if you like, in Australia very shortly. Uh, it kicks off on, let me just check the date here, the 9th of May this, this year. So I've been doing a lot of research in the back end because um, every year I like to produce a bit of a guide to the internship and so that is now live on the Advancement blog website. You can see it's quite a long post. Um, I've got all the key dates there for you. Applications are opening on the 9th of May this year, closing on the 6th of June. So there's usually like a month period where you can apply. Um, there's a little bit of pause between allocation to allow for some other activities to happen which are usually around um, some of the priority schemes or the, in some of the states have an interview phase and a matching phase, uh, particularly, particularly for things like rural uh, internships. It's actually very pleasing to see that a number of the states now, in fact, I think most of them, states and territories do have rural internship in the initiatives as well as Aboriginal um, specific internship initiatives, which is great. Um, it's important to know that those usually come out a little couple of days for, well, they usually come up earlier and this was a little bit, um, different state and territory wise every year, but they've actually aligned the dates for the special offers and then the main offers this year. So all the dates are the same, and there's a reason for that. There's this thing going in the background with the national intern order, which is all geared to try and make sure that all the intern posts get filled as quickly as possible around the country. But anyway, offers for the, the rural and other special pathways come out on the 18th, um, and then the 20th of July is when the main offers come out. And then there's rounds and rounds and rounds. Um, so for those IMGs watching, um, the first thing to know is that largely you're not eligible to apply for internship, but um, if you're an international student studying in Australia, you're again unlikely to get an offer in that first week. You're probably going to have to wait a round or so um, for them to get down the priority list. So anyway, the guide's out. Um, I counted this morning. Uh, at the moment, we have 3,779 internships available, the most being in New South Wales, not surprisingly. Um, I've got all the, they're all up to date with their info. Victoria have pretty much published the information, including the numbers now. Um, we're still waiting for their guide. 
Um, Queensland, look, uh, most of their information is now up to date for this year as well. You'll see that I've got all the priority information of priorities, the, how the process works, um, all the key links. Um, Western Australia, we're still waiting on some 2022 information. Um, what you'll also notice in each state, I've given a bit of a summary of the numbers, the salary, uh, which will vary based on things like overtime as well. Um, but you can see that there's not consistent salaries across the country. The length of contract, which is something that a lot of people uh, might want to sort of take into account when they're thinking about where they're going to apply. It's nice to have a longer than one year contract. Um, whether you've got a professional development allowance, um, some states now offer that as well, um, starting dates, etc. It's all there for you. And as I get more information coming through, um, I will update it uh, all the way through to, I'm just going to skip through to the end. Um, there is also the Commonwealth process, which sort of starts a bit later and it's kind of a mop up extra um, process to sort of help fulfill the need for international students who are uh, studying here to get an internship. Um, that information is going to come out a, a fair bit later. Um, so again, when I get some more info on that, uh, I'll try to update it. If people notice anything that's incorrect or they've seen some up to date information, feel, feel free to ping me um, and I'm happy to improve that post but it's all there set up for you um, to help you if you particularly if you're one of my medical student community followers who and I know there's a lot of them um, who are thinking about their internship excuse me their internship application for next year um, please share the link well you can see it in the URL up there Herbert but yeah I'll, I'll, I'll drop it in the sticker and drop it in the chat here uh, there you go um, Cool. Um, so um, we can talk about the national intern order, but we might um, we might look at people's questions now. So let me just scroll to the top here. Um, I think it's a way of me highlighting these. Um, yeah, maybe not. Um, so Shabazz, you want to sit for the AMC, but you have no idea. Where are you from, Shabazz? And what stage are you up to in your career? waiting for Shabos to apply, uh, reply. Um, um, one thing that you, I know it's a lot of you guys are on YouTube and then you'll see that I've got a lot of videos about IMC and things like that. Um, if, it, if your question is more about um, specifically around the examination process, um, then I do have a couple more detailed posts on my website about that. Um, um, so we've got the AMC MCQ guide, um, written by Dr. Noav Dandashi, um, who's a, been a long-term supporter of mine. Uh, and he's also helped in putting together an AMC clinical exam first time success guide. Um, uh, I don't know where he's up to with the clinical, but I know he's definitely, he definitely passed the AMC MCQ on the first pass. Um, also, a lot of people ask, is there a difference between the P-Lab and the AMC, and is there a better way of doing it? Well, a couple of experts from the UK, doctors Nick and Kim, they wrote me a post of comparing, well, we put it together, together actually, um, but it's a comparison of the P-Lab versus the AMC, which is going to become redundant in a year or so when they have the UK MLA exam over there. So those two posts, Shabazz, um, I see you might be, nope, um, they're probably your best start in terms of getting some more information. So you can see with this one, it's quite comprehensive. Um, uh, I don't know what the actual word count is, but there's lots of tips here. Uh, table of contents, um, the study guide, starting early, how, to, how long to study, how to squeeze time in at work, um, what textbooks, um, the utility of question banks, which Noab does recommend you get at least one. Like, it's like most exams, um, you want to study for the exam. So the best way of doing that is studying around questions. Um, he doesn't believe you necessarily need to do any courses. Some people would differ on that. Um, I do recommend a couple of courses. There's the Sharia's Academy and then there's um, the Alan Roberts IMG SAS uh, groups. I think they, they've kind of got more long-standing records and a fairly good reputation. There are others out there, uh, but they're the ones that I'm most familiar with and have a fair bit of confidence around. 
Um, yeah, lots of tips in that post. So if you're looking for, I think probably that's where you want to start with the AMC uh, Shabazz. There's a couple of things you have to do first before you can sit the exam. There's a guide about that on my YouTube channel about how there's the first step in getting registered, um, which is basically going to the Australian Medical Council website, registering with them, getting your primary degree verified. Once you've set all that up, the portal for the AMC exams will open up for you, and then you can pay and register for an exam. Uh, and then you, that's one of the things that Noel recommends in there, set a date for the exam you're targeting, so you're working towards something as well. So hopefully that helps you in terms of where you get started with the process. Um, I think that's probably enough to do while you're focusing on the MCQ, but after you pass your MCQ, you then want to focus in on actually applying for jobs. Um, and so that's a whole different topic. Um, and there are lots of videos and posts about that on my blog post as well. Um, and if, uh, we do actually, um, I'm doing, I have done a soft launch of my um, standard pathway course. Uh, I will show you that that's now available. It's a free course for IMG doctors. It's not complete. I'm waiting for a section to be completed by a colleague of mine um, who's currently, um, she's uh, having to have a bit of time off at the moment, but um, it, is, it is available um, under the courses section. It's called Becoming a Doctor in Australia. Close it up a bit. So you can enrol in it now. Um, and you'll see, and it, um, you'll see that we've got the first section built out, which is the bit that I'm talking about, Shabazz here, um, the, the process of obtaining a doctor job after you've got your, um, either your AMC part one or part one and part two, it doesn't really matter. Um, some tips around that. Um, the topical issues will be around things that are important to kind of know about when you're applying for jobs and starting out. So things like cultural awareness, um, handover, that sort of stuff. Uh, there will be a course Christmas certificate eventually as well. So that is that is available for people to sign up for and you, um, um, you're welcome to enrol in that. As I said, it's partly completed, but it's great to get some feedback on that. Um, so welcome, Andrea. Um, just working through the questions from everyone. Um, so the next question is from Abdul. Um, how to find area of need jobs for specialists in anatomic pathology. So Abdul, that's a good question. Um, area of need jobs are pretty much like a unicorn these days. Um, they don't really exist unless you stumble over one. Um, so I think you're probably heading down a bit of a, um, a rabbit hole there in terms of looking for area of need jobs. Generally what you need to do um, these days, um, and this is a good opportunity for me to also point out that there is a free course on becoming a specialist in Australia for specialist IMGs um, that is fully completed um, that you can enrol in here. Um, I'd recommend you doing that course uh, to give you a bit of a guide as to what you need to do. But essentially you're needing to get your specialist um, credentials assessed by the Royal College of Pathology Australia. Um, and get a comparability outcome. If you can obtain either a partial or substantial comparability outcome, then you will be able to apply for a range of spare, either specialist, excuse me, or advanced training type roles where they will take an applicant who's in the supervision part of the specialist pathway pathway. Um, there is no, like, well, sorry, there, is, there are a couple of lists of area of need. Um, but they are horribly out of date and no one ever responds to them. The, the one that um, you'll probably find if you Google like I did is the area of need vacancies in New South Wales. Um, I can tell you that a lot of these jobs have been up here for years. Uh, and I don't even, I sometimes email people to say, oh, are you still advertising that? Uh, and I often don't get a, um, a response. It's often because someone's already sitting in that job or they're just keeping it there just in case, but um, I don't think there's anything on pathology here. Like you can see there's other radiology ones. The, one of the other reasons why the radiology never gets filled is um, often, the, unfortunately the College of Radiology, um, they, will, they will often give people part of the comparability, they very rarely give them substantial, um, and often these jobs are looking for someone on substantial comparability. Um, I don't think there's any pathology there. So there is, there's a list for you. But I can tell you that very few people have had any success contacting people on that list. Sometimes the person's disappeared, 
um, and, the, and, you, and you often don't get a, a contact back. So I wouldn't so much bother about looking for area need jobs. I would, if you're um, considering going to the, the specialist pathway, wanting to work as an anatomical pathologist here, um, look into the process of being assessed by the college. I'd highly recommend you hit me up for some support and coaching around that. Generally what's best is my VIP program for that um, uh, and go from there. Um, so, Jose, Maria, um, thanks for all the videos, thank you. Um, so you got a job in Central Queensland after watching all your playlists about standard pathway CV making and interview skills. So thank you very much. It's uh, it's nice to know that my stuff does work. Uh, let me just put a little reply here. Thanks very much. Uh, it's nice to know that my resources do help doctors out. Money. Cool. Thank you for that. Um, well, that's good. And how's it going? If you're still watching. Um, okay, Harvey, um, is it easy for UK docs to get into psycho in Australia? Will this still be around the, the case around 2028 when I finish? Look, um, look, it's, it's very hard to predict, uh, things that far into the future, Harvey. Um, what I will say is, um, let me just tap a reply here as well. Um, uh, generally speaking um uk docs have always been able to find jobs here um, and there are plenty who are now with psychiatry training um yeah so you know if you're asking me now i'd say it's going to be you know let's say you're finishing your f2 uh, i would say you're probably going to um, have a pretty good chance of getting a resident or even senior resident job maybe in psychiatry um, within a few months of applying. Um, and once you've gone through that competent authority um, uh, process, um, then uh, you'll find that um, um, you'll find that you'll be re reasonably able to get into psychiatry training. Most people um, do. Someone said that the chat box is taking up too much space. Maybe I've made that too small now. Uh, let me just go back to, uh, let's put myself on screen. For some reason my stream deck keeps going through its different profile. Um, let me just tell me if this uh, is a better. I'm just gonna make the width a bit longer. 400, save. And then, oops, let me move it. Let me move it. Because I'm locked. Huh, okay. Well, I've sized down the chat box for you, so hopefully that's a little bit better for you guys. Um, although it's now not showing any of the messages, which is a bit of a pain. Um, let me just see if I can fix that. No, I don't have that on the thing. Um, let's try code again. Okay. Um, so hopefully that's a little bit easier to see. I do recognise my head's still in the way there a bit. I don't know how to, I'm not actually sure how I can chuck this thing around the screen a bit. Um, do that again. It's great. I'm trying to move that widget, but it's not moving. So I'll stop fiddling with it. Um, maybe if I move over this way. So the next question is 
uh, link for an internship. Yeah, I've shared that. Um, how difficult for doctors residing overseas, not UK, Ireland, or New Zealand to secure a general RMO job? Uh, I passed AMCQ and PTE. Um, one thing that will affect that TRH is your actual PTE score. Um, so uh, if you do a little bit better than what's called the PAR score, which I forget what it is for PTE, uh, for example, an IELTS is seven, minimum seven, seven overall, um, OET is minimum B. So if you can say do like an eight overall in the IELTS, um, whatever the equivalent of that is in the PTE, um, that is gonna stand out for employers. I always give that piece of advice. I always try to demonstrate that your English language skills are above the minimum. Um, that's often um, looked for. Um, so that would be one piece of um, advice that I would give. Um, uh, the, yeah, so in terms of difficult, look, um, if you actually crunch the numbers, most people seem to actually get a job, but um, there's a big backlog. Um, and I think, but if you look at the number of people actually completing exams versus the number of registrations for that category every year, it's, it's fairly equivalent. Um, so I think most doctors, if they persist in the standard pathway, do actually get a position, but some will miss out. Um, and unfortunately, if you've been going for a while and you haven't been practicing clinically somewhere elsewhere, then that tends to not go in favor. So hopefully that helps you out. Um, I have got a blog post and a video about common questions about the standard pathway, which I, I would encourage you to um, check out. Um, I'm just going to try and see if I can. I don't know if you can luck with my social chat. Um, um, I'm just trying to see if I can actually decrease the size of the script as well, but um, that might be a little bit better because the font's a little bit smaller. Um, so, uh, second question from Javier. Um, what things help you get into site training in Australia? Um, uh, the, the, look, the, most people will get into psychiatry training. It's not overly competitive, so that's probably the first thing to say. Um, but you do have to be sincere about your um, reasons. So I think a bit of experience, a bit of reflection as to whether you're suited to psychiatry training is really the important stuff. They're often also looking to make sure that you've had a fair bit of general medical experience and can look after some of the medical problems that occur in patients with mental illness, because unfortunately, Often when you've got a patient on the ward with a medical problem, it's sometimes hard to get the physicians or surgeons or whatever interested. So you've got to be able to manage those sort of things as well. And obviously now, nowadays, we have a lot of comorbidity between somatic medicine and mental medicine. Um, so, yeah, they're probably the key things. A um, bit of experience, having looked at what the training program is all about, reflected on whether you've got an aptitude for that. And... Um, uh, you know, I used to sit in on a lot of psychiatry selections um, uh, and, um, you know, most people we would accept. The ones that we would reject seem to have, um, they're often refugees from something else. So maybe a general practitioner thinking that psychiatry is going to be an easier specialty to be involved in. And you get a little bit of that in medicine. There's, I remember as a medical administrator, I would sometimes be contacted by another department saying, I've got this doctor that needs a bit of a rest. Could I send them over to you to work in psychiatry? And it's like, well, no, it's not. It's just as hard here. Um, so, yeah, so you often had people that sort of had this kind of idea that you would, you know, see six patients a day for an hour and a half and the nurses would do everything and it would be a nice leather couch in the corner. Um, so they would not get accepted onto the program. But those that had researched it, had some experience, could say why they had an aptitude for it, would generally um, be able to get in. So hopefully that answers your question there, Javier. Uh, it's definitely a good specialty to be in if you're looking at working in different countries, you know, because you'll find in most countries there's a need for psychiatrists. On the flip side, because there's a need for psychiatrists, you're often very busy wherever you end up as well. Um, Sarah, is there any list for hospitals that provide sponsorship? Um, visa. Um, now, there's not there's not really a list, Sarah. Um, 
um, generally what happens is a lot of the hospitals now expect you to do this on your own. Um, uh, oh, if you're talking about, sorry, you're talking about getting your first job. Um, so, yeah, um, so most of the hospitals will, if you need a visa and they accept you, will help you out. A lot of them outsource it to medical recruitment companies because it's quite technical. Um, uh, so the way to know that the hospital is going to support you with a visa is to know that the selection criteria um, are saying eligible for registration. So if you're eligible for registration, they know that they're going to get a lot of, uh, if your criteria says eligible for registration, they know they're going to get a lot of applications from doctors who don't have a work visa at the moment, uh, and they need to be prepared that if they give them a job offer, they're going to have to help them. Um, that being said, if you've got a work visa already, you know, maybe you, for example, married to an Australian or something like that, that will help. Um, so no, there is no list of hospitals which provide sponsorship. You have to look at the um, selection criteria for the job and maybe have a look through some of the information or ask some, some questions, uh, further questions of them. Um, uh, so there's a reply to that as well. Um, there is no such list. You need to look at the job description and ask questions of the employer. Um, so, uh, Javier, again, thank you for the info. Um, I might have been focusing these on the screen before. It seemed to be, uh, yeah, it doesn't seem to be able to let you promote them at the moment. Um, is psychiatry becoming more popular, especially in Australia? Um, I think so. I'd like to think so. I'd like to think I've had a hand, hand in that a little bit uh, with some of the initiatives that I've done to try and increase popularity locally, which have been adopted in other parts of Australia. Um, it, is, it, it always suffers, though. It suffers from a bit of stigma within the medical profession as well. well the other problem is that um, there's much more public awareness of the need for mental health services and mental health practitioners. So arguably, whilst we might have been increasing the number of psychiatrists and other health practitioners, particularly psychologists in Australia, that has not met the demand. <laughs> That's part of the problem. Um, what are the easiest specialties for UK doctors to get into for training? Um, so we do have a, I'd like me to see why the stream deck goes back to this all the time, but anyway, um, so if I go back to my website, um, possibly moved off the front page now. Yeah, um, so. This one, it, it, check out this post. What are the entry requirements for special training in Australia? Um, there are some, if I skip down to the bottom, I'm down the bottom here, um, some colleges where you need permanent residency or citizenship to apply. So a way of answering your question is to say, um, um, these are the ones that are harder to get into. Surgery, Sports medicine, dermatology, ophthalmology, obstetrics and gynaecology, and dental surgery. Um, there are probably a few others that are, you know, harder. Um, but largely speaking, you won't be any different as a UK trainee doctor if you come through the competent authority pathway. Um, other than the fact that you may not have permanent residency yet, which will exclude you from applying for some of these programs. But um, you'll be assessed on your merits otherwise for most other training schemes and usually there's a pathway and I know there's another question about this within about three years you've got about a path if you've generally registered you've got a pathway to permanent resident residency usually but you want to talk to a migration agent about that so once you've got your permanent residency you're on an absolute equal footing um, best course to prepare for the AMC too Sarah um, I don't have a firm opinion on that um, as I said the the two that um, I recommend people checking out well, actually, I'm not sure that Shari does a um, for AMC two. The one, the only one really that I recommend people checking out um, is the the courses that are run by um, 
Alan Roberts, I'm GSAS, so Arindasas is the is the website. Um, let me just clock that up for you. Um, there's a bunch of options there for clinical exams, so it's this one here. Um, uh, I know um, I know that they do they do MCQs and clinical prep courses. Um, that's John Murtar, by the way. <laughs> He's the uh, first professor of general practice in Australia, um, and that's Alan Roberts. Um, I don't think I know Sharia does some work on the MCQ, uh, and he's got a clinical course, um, but I think it's not a, like an in-person prep course. Um, so I haven't sort of I've seen his success rates with the AMC MCQ. Um, Okay, five days intensive physical exam course. He was talking about running in Australia. I don't, I, I don't know a lot about that, so I couldn't, couldn't definitely say that I recommended that. But um, yeah, the one that most people tend to recommend is the Alan Roberts one. Um, but there are various options, so you want to sort of check out them, and they're not cheap either. Um, Paluk, what would you recommend for Australian citizen who completed his medical studies in the EU and is looking to practice in Australia? Um, it's a pretty non-specific question there, Paluk. Um, I mean, essentially, you would be looking at the AMC exams and standard pathway. As I said, there is a bit of an argument that maybe you're better off going the P Lab route, getting your registration in the UK, working for a year, and then applying here. But a lot of EU citizens aren't actually able, or weren't able to sit the P Lab exams previously. Although I understand that might be changing with the UK MLA. As well as the fact that Britain is no longer in the European Union, so if you can get equivalency in the UK through that process, that's another way of um, coming to work in Australia. Um, the main pain points that I find for people um, who are applying through the standard pathway is they focus too much on the exams uh, and underestimate the effort and the the skill and the strategy you need to put in place for actually obtaining that first job. Largely that comes down to having a really well optimised CV. You can really stand yourself out if you put some effort on your CV um, and I do offer a service for that. Um, and then, ha then having some good interview skills. Things like recency of practice are important as well. Um, employers are really reluctant to take on doctors who had a few years out of medicine. Um, so I hope that Helps you out with tips. Um, so Abdul, you're a specialist without PR. You've got a partial comparable par yeah, par par outcome in anatomic pathology. Um, how to approach for training physicians to complete the comparability fellowship. So what you're looking to apply find is advanced training sort of fellowship roles, Abdul, where they will accept someone um, who. Uh, hasn't got full registration in Australia, so I would get onto the these portals and register for pathology jobs through these various links, and then I would look at Seek. Um, I set this up to be healthcare medical. Uh, I would take the medical specialist out, so we want residents and registrars, um, and then you would put pathology in and see what pops up. Not a lot. Um, you might sort of put pathologist. It'll probably come up with speech pathologist. Um, you could you could do anatomical pathology, but I doubt, doubt that that will pop up. So you've just got to keep searching. Um, then the next thing that a lot of people don't do, this is applies to most IMGs watching, is think about their own networks and how they can expand them. Um, who do you know that's working in Australia? Can they connect you up to someone who's in a hiring position in a hospital, get their, your resume through, that sort of thing? Um, can you link up with existing, in your case, pathologists in Australia through online or even thinking about coming out to um, a conference here? Um, so it's often a good idea to sort of look at, say, RCPA, 
now that you know everything's moving back to people being able to visit Australia again, um, you want to sort of see when are the um, the main um, conferences and things because that's when you'll be able to network with a bunch of pathologists and meet people and make connections, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so we did a, most college websites are a little bit easier in terms of um, figuring stuff out, but there will be some sort of overall congress. Um, I don't know they've got a bunch of different sort of options. So I'd, I'd have a look through these and sort of see, um, is there a big congress coming up? Um, here we go, there is this this one here down the bottom, the scientific meeting. So that's only, well, unfortunately that's um, very soon, but you might want to sort of um, think about um, uh, the following year, um, or there might be, with, with groups like the RCPA, they'll have section conferences for things like um, anatomical pathology, so there might be an event for just the section of anatomical pathology that is worth attending in person if you can. So that's another um, suggestion that I have. Um, there's a friend of mine, Naj, um, he joined a golf club where the local medical administrator for his hospital <laughs> played golf. <laughs> so that was another thing that he, he can do, that was done to sort of network effectively. Um, Muhammad, should specialist IMG doctors give the ANC CAT exam? Um, so I'm just going to correct your English here because this is important when you're applying for jobs um, in Australia. So it's sit, not give. Um, in your country, would give would be give, but in our country, would say we sit the exam, or um, or something like that. Um, so um, no uh, is generally the answer to that question. Um, I would not be bothering sitting the exam um, if you're a specialist IMG already. A few reasons for that. Um, one is uh, we, we're talking about an exam that's set at the level of medical students exiting medical school in Australia. So it's a general exam of medical knowledge and when you get to the clinical, um, clinical aptitude and knowledge as well. So you have to go back and learn medicine, surgery, psychiatry, general practice, obstetrics and gynecology, paediatrics, and a few other things that I'm forgetting now. Um, it's a pretty, I mean, the, the MCQ is reasonably doable in terms of its pass rate. It's about somewhere like 65%, 70%. So as an eye specialist IMG, you can probably pass it. But then the next problem is that, and it depends on how long you've been a specialist for, but generally most specialists have done you know, five or six years worth of training and then a few years as a consultant. So it's been a long time since you've been a resident doctor. The employers are going to be reluctant to give you an opportunity to work as a resident doctor because they're going to see you as too specialised in your own area and not flexible enough to um, come back and work at a resident level. Um, and then the, so, you know, you're, you're less likely to get a job opportunity. It's, um, the employers are not meant to discriminate on the basis of age in this country, that's um, illegal, um, but that sort of factor does creep in in terms of, you know, someone who's had a few years working at a general level versus someone who's now a specialist, who's going to fit in more easily, generally they'll go for the more junior doctor in that circumstance. The final reason is, even if you do get the part one, get a job, maybe complete your part two, get your general registration. Um, you are now generally registered in Australia and you've got to start all over again. So if your aim is to work as a specialist doctor here in a specialty field, you've still got a bit of a, a question mark as to whether you're going to be able to accept it into the training scheme for your specialty or you're going to have to pick another specialty. So it's a long route to then becoming be able to work as a specialist here. So generally in most situations, um, when I advise people, they're either much better off contemplating doing the specialist pathway process or maybe Australia is not for them. Australia is not for every doctor um, from overseas. Um, some people have a better chance. Um, and part of that's just unashamedly about what types of doctors Australia needs to complement its existing workforce. Um, and also, you know, Australia should be, in theory, developing the majority of its own medical workforce without raiding other countries, particularly countries that are from a developing perspective rather than um, 
than Australia being a developed country. So hopefully that answers your question. A um, couple more questions here. Uh, question about psychiatry training. So I'll refer you to um, the video I did about how specialty training works a few months ago, five year. Um, uh, essentially, psychiatry training is broken down into three stages. Um, it used to be two basic and advanced, kind of. Um, there are a bunch of assessments, including formal exams, kind of scattered all the way through the program. Um, I will acknowledge that the um, it's a little bit hard to understand when you go to the college's website because they don't have like a handbook like most colleges do. It's kind of scattered through a bunch of different documents. Um, but if you go to the training section, um, you'll be able to read about the programs. It's stage one, two, three. It's pretty much all there. You've just got to hop around. It would be nice if it was like in a handy, I mean, there's like flow charts and things like that, but it's not like a comprehensive um, handbook that I've discovered anyway. And part of it is because there's so many choices in stage three. Um, you could do a general advanced training stage three, or there's a whole bunch of different certificates of advanced training. Um, so check out all that info. And if you want some more guidance around that, then um, I'd recommend maybe booking one of my strategy calls. Uh, thank you from Sarah. Um, ben, can't reply here. It's not letting me reply. Oh, okay. <laughs> Possibly because I've got it on screen at the same time. It's confusing. Let's go back to me here. Let me see if I can say thanks back. Oh, no, I can't let me do it. Oh, yeah. Uh, cool. Um, well, if. There are no more questions. I might just quickly um, do a little snippet about the National Intern Audit. Um, just for any medical students who might be watching or watching later. Um, let me get this into play mode. Go back to the recording here. Go back to that play. That's doing that. Try that again. Wow. Um, so the National Intern Audit, just briefly, um, there is no central application for internships in Australia. Um, so um, you have to apply to up to nine jurisdictions. Um, for your internship, depending on how, ma how much you want to hedge your bets and uh, how many places you want to apply for and where you, your preference is. So there's nine separate application processes which can get you quite busy over that month-long period where you're applying. Um, now one of the problems there is that uh, there's probably going to be about 3,800, maybe a bit more internships in Australia next year, but maybe about 4,500, maybe a bit more, 5,000 individual applicants, and probably a lot more applications when you count dual and triple applications around the place where people might be studying in one state and, they, and perhaps they want to go back to their home state, for example. Um, so that makes the system potentially a little bit more complex than just one round of here's all the jobs, here's who's got one job, etc. because um, some people will get um, an allocation in one round, that they are happy with, but they're sort of hoping that another state um, might give them an offer at a later date, so they'll sit on that application hoping for another um, opportunity. So you can get to this situation where some people have got them, some, some people have got more than one, 
uh, and then you have people who haven't got one yet. And obviously, this is important because the internship period is a provisional period prior to being able to get the general registration. Now, what does it mean to get general registration in Australia? It, it, it does mean you're fully licensed. It doesn't really mean you can do step out and do too much stuff independently these days. You still have to train some sort of specialty generally to you know, work in the private sector and build Medicare. But you know, in theory, you can start to do things like locums and stuff. Um, but it is pretty important to get to that general registration step. And without general registration, obviously, you can't apply for specialty training. So the National Intern Audit, in a nutshell, is about getting all the states and territories to share their information about um, where applicants have been placed and who's got a position offer, who's accepted, so that they can identify people that have dual or even triple offers on the table. And there'll be a pause through the various rounds of the allocation process to do all that, to look through that data and compare and contrast. Um, and then someone at the National Intern Audit Office uh, which is actually run out of New South Wales, the Health Education Training Institute. So HEDI will run its own internship application system, but independently from that, some another group of staff um, are set up at HEDI to do the national process, and they, they don't share it well. Other than the information that's required to be shared, there's no cross-sharing of information or anything like that. But if you're in a situation where you do have more than one offer, expect to be run by someone from HEDI to say, we've identified you with dual applications, you have to accept one and decline the rest. Um, let us know which one that's going to be. And so what that does is free up extra positions so that the whole thing can proceed a little bit more efficiently um, and timely so that we get to November, which is the sort of end of the nationally coordinated um, application process uh, and most intern ships have been offered and accepted and there's not so many people still waiting, if any, at that point. There usually are a few waiting at that point, and then it moves into something called the late vacancy management process. But largely, um, as we get through that process, the states and territories exhaust people who are interested in an internship. And actually, the numbers on offer um, usually don't um, compare with the actual outcome. There's usually a few less internships um, being worked in than the actual offers on the table. So that's what the National Intern Audit process is about. Um, and it came about when there was a concern that there weren't enough internships and even a bit of a push for a centrally allocated process. Um, but it started in 2010, 2011, and um, it's done a very good job of streamlining the system, if you like. So um, I see a question from... Jose Maria. Um, oh, actually, I'll, I'll do Javier's first. So Javier, no international medical graduates. No. Inter yes, international medical graduates can apply for internships in Australia, but you are extremely, very unlikely to get one. And usually, it's in a very specific situation where you haven't completed an internship already. Um, uh, and so there's not a lot of opportunities for IMGs to apply for internship. If you go back to my post, which I'm not going to go back to this time, um, the three states which will generally accept applications from international doctors are Queensland, South Australia, and Northern Territory. But there are specific requirements around those, and generally it's you haven't commenced an internship already. Uh, and then there's a Commonwealth process, again, um, they, well, actually, they, they, they will take some IMGs, but usually they are already working in the systems. So they've already got a job, and they're not really doing an internship. They just take, if there's a vacancy, um, they're in what's called the second priority group. They might be able to slot into one of those vacancies. So basically, essentially, in all reality, there is no opportunity for IMGs to do an internship in Australia. You shouldn't bother applying for the process, in my opinion because you're very unlikely to be offered one. You're most likely to be just uh, told you're not eligible. Um, and if you're in the UK, you probably have general registration already, maybe through working through the, you know, maybe a medical graduate in the UK. So you can apply through the Common Authority Pathway for a resident medical officer job. Um, that's what you should do. Um, Jose Maria, uh, last question for today. Um, is there any data on how well IMGs are performing in RMO jobs, just so we know what to improve on before studying for? Um, not really. 
Um, yeah, I'm not aware of any data that tells us whether how many IMGs don't succeed, say in their provisional jobs or limited registration jobs, or just uh, like more rates of underperformance or anything like that. Um, um, so I don't, yeah, I can't sort of point you to any data set there. Um, Generally, the sort of job skills that employers are looking for are general job skills. Yes, they want you to have a bit of medical knowledge and expertise, but they also want you to be able to display common sense, know when to call for help, have good communication skills, be a good team worker. That's what they're generally looking for at that level. Um, and yes, question from the Facebook user here. Um, just as I said to Javier, um, you want to finish your um, foundation year one before applying for the RMA job in Australia. Um, you won't be able to apply for the job in Australia if you haven't got UK experience. Um, if you've done your medical school in the UK, you need to at least get your foundation year one under the, uh, dealt with so that you can apply for the Commonwealth RMA. So thanks guys for joining me this morning. Hopefully that was useful for you guys. Um, be great to have some suggestions about things I should cover next time. Looks like we had a largely an international audience, which I guess is not unsurprising on a weekday. Um, and I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks' time. Bye.